Hello, everyone, and welcome to Overexposed, a BWRM podcast where we delve into the ins and outs of running a real estate photography and videography business. My name is Dave Temple. And my name is Jackie Kirk. Today's episode is part one of a five-part series on the pillars that form BWRM. We're often asked what exactly it is that BWRM does to help creatives. It's a big question with a long answer, so we've broken it down into our five pillars, product, portal, people, process, and pathway. Today, we're talking about pillar one, product. Joining us is our founder and CEO, Guy LePage. For those of you who don't know him, Guy's been running a real estate photography business for about 15 years and started BWR in back in 2016. How this all happened is a fascinating story, so if you're interested in hearing more, have a listen to episode four. Welcome, Guy. It's great to have you back. Thanks for having me. Great to be back. Good. So... Shall we just get straight into this? Pillar one, product. Guy, can you explain what BWRM offers under pillar one? Yes. So um, I suppose what we, what we offer broadly is, a, is the platform as you, as you described, and that's propped up by those five pillars. Those pillars make up the engine room of a real estate photography business. So that's sort of how I like to describe it. Um, so today we're talking about the product pillar, um, and that is... The basically the end thing that we deliver to our client. So the, the piece of marketing that we deliver to our client. Um, so whether that be professionally edited images or, um, a really amazing video or a, or a Instagram reel or a, um, you know, branded floor plan. How did you go about setting this up? You started BWRM and we discussed it a little bit in, um, episode four, but you realized that you needed to be outsourcing your work pretty quickly in your business, didn't you? Yeah. So one of the things that we do in a, and another pillar is is we work out what a high payoff activity is for a photographer. Um, and really what's at core is building relationships and going out and doing shoots, right? Um, and to do that and do that effectively without killing yourself, you really need to be able to outsource the production of that work um, in a really consistent and high quality way. So you can continue to build relationships and continue to go out and do the work. So the product pillar is about freeing up time, um, but maintaining a really, really high quality. And in a lot of cases, much higher quality than you could actually do yourself. Um, and things like video, for example, take a very long time to produce to a really high level. So being able to push that out at the end of the day to an editing team through the other pillar, one of our other pillars, the portal, um, you, you know, allows you to wake up in the morning and, and have an edited video that's ready to be delivered to your client, which is just almost impossible on your own. So, Guy, photos, floor plans, videos, reels, site plans, all of this stuff, where's all of this getting produced? Uh, it depends on the product, um, but... What we, well, start with video because that's probably the most exciting. Um, that gets done in Mauritius um, at, at a studio that we started in 2017, I think it was, um, when we realised video was going to be a really big part of the market um, and there just were no ready-made solutions. So, Jackie, you grew up in Mauritius um, and we had connections there. So, over we went and started our studio. And so then um, we have floor plans. We, we uh, started a business in Vietnam that produces our floor plans. Um, and then we also started image production in Vietnam, but we ended up running into quite a lot of challenges with that early on. And we ended up using uh, a company that already existed and, and um, co-opting their high-end team um, and their quality team and their finesse team to just do our work um, so a really well-established business there. And um, so, yeah, that's in Vietnam as well. So all of this seems like a huge amount of work to set up. So you had your business running um, on the Bellarine Peninsula doing a huge amount of work, and then did you go overseas and, and do all of this in person? Um, look, back in the good old days, I actually had it all in-house. So I had done it all, you know, with with people I knew locally. So I had retouches and I think I talked about that briefly in the in the previous podcast, but I had a retouching team locally. Um, 
we, Nick and I, the, one of the other directors of BWRM, I think he was in a podcast recently as well. He, he and I actually set up a local floor plan outsourcing team. Um, and I used to have an in-house editor. So I'd had experience in, in systemizing and training and, and obviously, um, well, not obviously, but in the previous podcast, you know, I talked about my sort of the way I do process um, and my background in process. So I'd sort of been able to break those things down and really create step by step processes before. So I'd had experience doing that and I understood what needed to be done, but I'd never, never ventured off our, um, our shores to do that. Um, cause that, you know, that obviously brings in a whole other, set of challenges, you know, starting a business in another country. What do you think the main um, lessons you, you learned from setting it up yourself? Because obviously you set it up yourself and then we moved to outsourcing in a different country. So there must have been a lesson learned to, to make you make that decision. Yeah. So so what I was finding is that I was struggling with turnaround, so turnaround time. Um, so because, you know, realistically, if you if you're finishing a day of shooting, and you're getting um, your photos edited locally, it's either being done on the night shift or it's being done the next day. So I couldn't meet deadlines was really the issue. And if there were issues or I needed extra things done, I couldn't get them done because I was relying on really, you know, I didn't have a a team with enough breadth. I I had a couple of people. So, you know, I I could see that burnout was something that was going to happen. Um, so I really needed to have a team and just crunching the numbers, you know, with what the market is, the real estate market is in Australia and what the marketing costs are. Um, I, I knew that I, I just couldn't make that work in Australia. Um, similarly with my video editor, you know, I had one editor in house. Um, you know, he might have started the, sh- the edit when I got home, uh, or got back to the office at that time. Um, and, you know, worked into the day to deliver that the next day. But at the end of the first year, you know, I, I, the wage bill was higher than what I built in video. So again, same, you know, it, it, economics just didn't, didn't add up. So offshore was a really good option in terms of, um, building breadth and width in a team, um, because, you know, you, you can have lower wages, but that's not the main driver. The main driver is, is really getting that turnaround and that, that, um, you know, Moving away from the reliance on a, on a couple of key people, presumably as well. One of the one of the benefits of offshore outsourcing is that suddenly you're not in charge of, you know, training the team anyway, because you would you were presumably doing that. Yeah, yeah. There's a huge amount. So I mean, obviously, you know, you've got to be really careful because there's sweatshops out there effectively in in our industry, right? So you don't want to you don't want to just go chasing a cheap product. Right. What you've got to do is try to create a product that's every bit as good as, as we have here, if not better, and then put really high quality processes in. And it, and it sort of flows into what we do with creative businesses. You know, you need to make it sustainable. So you need the, the video editor or the floor plan drawer or the image retoucher to be getting a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. Um, and then you need to put the resources around there so they really understand what, the, what it is they're supposed to do. So the role clarity stuff. And then you can, you need to put sort of a management oversight training, um, around them. So you wrap, wrap everything around them in very much the same way as we, we have our pillars here. You know, in each of those businesses, there's those same sort of pillars. Um, and that really then allows you to grow and expand. So, you know, it, yeah, I, I don't go in and train every video editor, every floor planner or every image, um, retoucher anymore you know it's get get the basics right get the great people in place and then have a really good culture in those businesses where people are really invested in the success you know they're part of our team they feel like they're part of our team and 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 then what you'll find is you'll have a a product that just keeps getting better and better on its own because it's it's you know we've created that ecosystem within that business where where it it, your ecosystem or flywheel or whatever it is but it's just this continual circular you know do a great job, get some great feedback, do it, try to do a little bit better job and then throw in a bit of extra tech in there and, and all of these things that sort of feed in in a, in a way and you just keep keep developing, keep growing and, and keep building better products. So talk to me a little bit about the video editing house because that's, you know, one of our really exciting ones. I think there are, there are a few image editing houses and retouching houses around the country but I haven't found it or around the world rather but I haven't seen anything 
quite like the video editing. Um, what was that like to set up and what sets it apart? Um, yeah, so to set it up, I mean, it was a little bit um, it's, it's exciting, you know, I like creating a new business. Isn't that fun, right? And it was in another country and that country happened to be Mauritius. So brilliant, you know, tick, tick, tick. Um, but but realistically, you know, it took, it took you know, us, using the network that you had, Jackie, you know, finding the right people took probably the most amount of time. Um, and we really found the right people. Um, uh, having a model that that made sense to everybody involved at the time. So you know, we we had or have you know Max who runs the the video editing house. You know, he's a he's a shareholder of BWRM. You know, it makes sense. Um, and yeah, and then basically, really, what we did is we just went through and we overcame challenges over time. Um, but what we set out to do, and I think that's really important to mention and, and what we continue to do is not just do what maybe other people do or what you've always done. What we really wanted to do was create something that was the best possible outcome for us, right? So, so you know, sending video files in those times was hugely challenging. So, we uh, had to create a process whereby our members would generate a smaller proxy file. They would get that offshore. That would come back, and then they'd have to link it all back together. And just as I hit Mauritius, Adobe released um, new software that made that whole process a lot easier. So everything that we'd done for six months prior to me hitting the ground in Mauritius, we basically had to redo in two weeks, um, which we did. Um, and now, as it turns out, where the some of the, well, we are the biggest user of that service for Adobe globally, which is their Adobe Team projects. Um, and Andrew, who Jackie, I think you know quite well, um, has done quite a lot of our custom software for us within that software. Um, so much to the point where you know he's got a really great relationships with the engineers at Adobe. So you know we have degrees of automation that just take out non-creative steps. So all of the nonsense that you have to do just to get a video ready can be done at the push of a button. Um, we're continuing to develop that to try to bring in AI just to get things faster so then we create more space for the editor to be more creative and de deliver a better product in the same amount of time. Um, and, and we've continually done that. And how many editors do you have working there? Uh, we've got five, I think. Five people doing, Dave, how many videos a month? Uh, on average, 250. Yeah. That's that's insane. And that'll spike out, uh, you know, 100 videos beyond that in, in peak times. And so, so that's really interesting. So it's that automation that seems to be the automation, the culture there as well, but that seems to be the, the special source. Do you think you lose a creative element when you bring in automation or is it the opposite? Well, no, I think, I think you can. I mean, I think you can do automation badly or you can do it well. It just depends what your goal is. And, and for us, the goal was best videos you can get, right? That's number one, um, you know, in terms of the product. So every bit of automation was just designed to take time away from the setup to free up time for the creative. And then if you do that, you can maintain a price point, right? And so no one's getting stooged. No one, we're not screwing down the video editors to do something cheaper. We're, we're just maintaining a time standard. But in that time standard, we, you know, I think we last thing that, um, Andrew achieved, or actually the thing that he's working on now is looking like taking literally 20 minutes out of the video process that has nothing to do with creativity. So once we implement that, we'll have created another 20 minutes in that place where the editor can make decisions that are, that are creative, which gives us an edge, you know, it gives us a better product. And all no price, no price change. We don't need to lower the price. We, we just get a better product for the same price. The editor feels better. They've got more time to be creative. And just while we're talking about um, timescales, just for people who, who are maybe listening and, and uh, haven't used the service, um, what, what will be the timescale, the turnaround time for a video in general? Well, <laughs> when we set it up, we set it up as a 24-hour turnaround. So I upload tonight at 
four or five o'clock, you know, in the afternoon. Um, that might take an hour to upload or, you know, two back in the good old days. Um, that edit would, I would expect that 24 hours later. But what's really happened is that we're basically getting them overnight almost every time. Now, there are occasions where there's a lot of footage and it comes late and, you know, a lot of after effects required and you're not going to get it the next morning and that's okay. But, uh, you know, we're talking upwards of 90% of the videos are ready. If you get it off this afternoon, you'll have it by 8 o'clock in the morning. And has the process changed? Are you still doing linking and and converting? No. So you can. So what we've we've maintained that as an option, um, but and I know we'll get to the portal at another time, that pillar of, of the platform. But, um, you know, we since we started this project, we created our own portal and that really was a game changer with getting image, uh, getting video files across to the editors. So what they do is they still create a team project. They still, you still have the ability to sync your stuff up at your end directly into Premiere and make any changes you want. It could be as simple as just adding an extra agent to the end of the video in the morning and then exporting it. Um, you've still got that functionality, but it, you know, in my business at least, I, I just don't use it anymore. I, I, I don't need to, but it's there as a backup if I want to. Presumably, that's a good option for people with either cameras that shoot huge formats or people in really poor um, internet areas as well. Yeah, and that look, and again, you know, we were all in poor internet areas in Australia once upon a time, and now some of us are lucky. Well, I'm not. Some of some people are lucky to have decent internet now. Um, but yeah, it, you know, it's it's a live option to be able to create create proxy files. So what's your process then if you've got great internet? Just take me through. You've shot a video or one of your contractors or staff members have shot a video. They upload it. What are they doing to upload it? Yeah. So so we first of all, and, and we'll get to this in another in another podcast, one of the pillars is process, right? So that's about how we capture on site. So we get that bit right. So we're not overshooting, right? And so when we get home, we plug our uh, memory card into our computer um, we select our up to around 60 video clips. We drag and drop them into our, into our portal in the other pillar that we'll talk about another time. We hit upload, brief pops up. We pop in the details that we need that are, that are pertinent. Um, you know, if there's going to be some call out titles, we've got our little screen grabs and some markups. Often they're already done for the drone images anyway. Drag and drop those in, upload completes, move on with your life. Um, and then in the morning, I'll open up. The portal. I'll, I'll review the video, um, you know, and, and I might have some amazing add-ons like th- that we've been able to create huge levels of automation to make much, much more efficient for the editors. Um, like my reels, for example. So I might have the full edit and then a thirty-second reel that's only costing me a very small amount more to have done. I'll view those, assuming they're correct. Hit deliver. Now, what I've done with my clients is I've maintained that. Yes, you'll probably get it in 12, but 24 hours is the time standard. So what that allows me to do is if there are changes that need to be made or whole things that I'm not happy with, which doesn't happen very often, let me tell you, but if there are, I'll send that feedback back through our portal. That'll get to the editors when they start work at roughly 2 p.m. our time and um, I'll have that back that evening. So, And then I'll deliver it in the evening, like as in five, four, five o'clock, something like that. So I don't touch Premiere anymore. So you've got like pretty strict, I know we're going to talk about processes in the other podcast. Sorry, Deb. Is there opportunity for flexibility if you've got, you know, you've got standard real estate videos and that sort of things. What if someone does something a little bit different, a little bit special, something that's, you know, going to be a lot of clips? Are there options for that? Absolutely. And and actually what we have to do with the video um, editing house is we actually take on any other work that isn't real estate outside of BWM. And, that, and that's really cool because that keeps the editor sharp, you know, and it, and it broadens their skill base. So, for example, you know, we've, we've edited stuff for the BBC and a Heston Blumenthal series. We've done, we just recently did Pirelli ads, um, Pirelli tyre ads. Um, you, you know, you name it, we can do it. You know, RM Williams have done some stuff. They, I mean, they wouldn't know that we're doing the, the bulk of the editing, but that's that's the reality. So putting stories together is is what the what you do. So there's nothing that you can't send to our editing house. There's nothing. And we can deliver all of it. So you you can 
and and I am, you know, really consistent with the products that we offer. You know, we offer a 30 second video, we offer a 45 second video, 60, 90, whatever. Um, and for that, I've got it right with the amount of clips that we're doing. Um, I've got that really clear, uh, uh, you know, just the, the meat and potatoes again to allow the, the, the creative to be creative within that framework. So, you know, you can, you can shoot 60 rubbish clips and get, still get a great video, or you can shoot 60 really great clips and get an amazing video. Um, so yeah, you, you know, if, but if you want to be there all day from dawn till dusk and come back and, shoot three dawns in a row and do, you know, fly through the house with a drone or do something bad, that's okay. You can. They'll just be, you know, the, you know, the, the, they'll, there's, there's a cost implication for that and a process implication that presumably the end user is well aware of. When you speak to um, other photographers on the internet and, uh, and in passing, a lot of them don't want to do floor plans because they don't see it as part of the business. Firstly, can you sort of explain why we do floor plans, which is a, it feels like a non-creative product. And secondly, how does that process work when getting them drawn up? Yeah, so it isn't really part of the creative um, uh, suite of offerings, but it is a product that our clients need and use. Um, and so any person who's running a business will sell products that their clients want. Um, so, you know, just because you run a cafe and you don't like orange juice doesn't mean you don't sell it, Right. So that's first, that's the mentality around floor plans sort of dealt with. So you're going to need to be able to do them because your clients want them. Um, and if you don't offer them, somebody else might, and that other somebody else might also be a lovely person who's a great photographer. And then all of a sudden you've let them into your clients, you know, in front of your clients and you don't want to do that. So doing floor plans is really critical from a business perspective, maybe not as a photographer, you know, or a purist perspective, but if you want to actually run a business, you run a business, right? So do the products that your, your client needs. Um, and then really what we've done there is we've created, um, uh, we've created a really simple process. And again, talk about process another time to get that input right, whether it's sketching on site, you know, or, you know, I know Dave, you did like some mad eight hexagon house the other day, you know, so sketching that, being able to deliver a sketch to that to the, to the floor plan artists or, or whether it's just taking a photo of a builder's plan, you know, you can offload that via the portal to the to the um, drawing team, and they will send you back an image based on your client's needs outputted. Now I know Jackie, you actually did some really beautiful work early on where you hand painted watercolor, and so we offer that as a one of our non branded styles. It's sort of a, our own thing. So we 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 Jackie painted from scratch all the elements and textures for a floor plan and then we digitise them and then we've moved them into the floor plan so you can order a watercolour style floor plan. Um, we've also got some other styles and we also match any style that an agency wants and or their brand style. That then comes back through the portal just like the videos the next morning and we also get an editable illustrator file. So if you want to make changes, you can or you can just, you know, through the beauty of our process, um, just request those changes straight back through the portal and, and they'll be done in you know, half an hour. And Dave, how many how many floor plans are we doing a month on there? Do you have those numbers? Yeah, so we're averaging 750 per month across the group. Wow. Does that include site plans or are they all just bundled together, I, I would presume? That's all that's all together. Yeah. Awesome. And yeah, so so look, it's 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 the unsexy work of of a real estate photographer is getting getting floor plans done, but it's a really necessary cross-sell. I really enjoy doing floor plans. I know you're bagging them out, but I find them quite relaxing and soothing. You get to give that creative side of your brain a bit of a rest, and for me it's kind of like sitting down and playing with Lego. It, it all makes sense when it comes together at the end. It's all logical. It's funny you should mention that because it's the, the classic left brain, right brain difference, you know. Now I can't yeah. remember which is which, of course, but the – Creative is going to use one part and the floor plan is going to use another part of your brain. Yeah. And I like the I actually I'm making them sound worse than they are because I like them too because they're either right or they're wrong. Yeah. And when you're creative, there's rules, but not everybody knows those rules. So somebody you might do everything right and it might look great and it might be right, but somebody else goes, Yeah, I don't like it. 
Whereas with a floor plan, like with a floor plan, it's like, well, it is the lounge room, so too bad. <laughs> I'm sorry, and it is five <laughs> meters by six meters. So sorry, and the window is there. So you can provide that nice little, like you said, like that nice little, you know, relief in your business where you're just like, well, this is not subjective. This is just it, right? And and yeah. activating that other side of your brain's fun too. And you can be, you can have fun with your labels as well. I remember being very pleased with myself. I did a I did a house and it was we're on the east coast and it had a, a northern deck and an eastern deck and I labeled them northern deck and eastern deck and the agents loved that and it was just like I don't know you can I yeah you can have fun you get into the occasional floor plan that's got a you know been done by an architect who's on drugs but like it's for the most part. They're, they're good fun and you can figure them out. They're like a puzzle. So, yeah, don't be put off floor plans. It can be an intimidating step for people who just want, you know, quotes, just want to be a photographer or just want to be a creative though. And I know we'll get into that in the in the other podcast, but that's where the process comes in. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But I think this is the difference too that is, is you know, the difference between wanting to be a photographer and wanting to run a business because – if you want to be a photographer, right, run a, you know, run a photography business, right, but shoot weddings. Well, there's going to be admin and there's going to be invoicing and there's going to be relationship man. There's going to be all sorts. Like you're not just taking photos. You're running a business. So the reality is, you know, it, it can be daunting, but too bad. You, you want to run a business, you've probably got to just get over it and get it done. Mm. Um, and and you will, you'll find it. You can do them almost, well, not literally, but almost with your eyes closed at the end of the day. Um, mm. you know, and I remember you had a floor plan that was, um, a little bit challenging and you'd done everything right. And you, you know, the agent had, had called you and said, you know, we're, we're really disappointed. The, the vendors, you know, hating the floor plan and, you know, it's all wrong. Anyway, they'd marked it up. And I remember one of the changes was they changed. They were just label changes, so nothing was actually wrong, but they changed the garage to be the car lounge. Yes. Yep. Apparently that's a thing in, in high circles. I'm not I'm not familiar with the it myself. Um, the car lounge. Yeah. If I went to the car lounge and there wasn't carpet, I'd be very disappointed. <laughs> there probably was cashmere carpet, so it was that kind of house. There was um there was the the Royal Suite as well. There was some yeah, some some wild um, breakout rooms. Yes, breakout rooms. Um, Wonderful time. Yeah, it was it was a very entertaining one. I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about images. This is probably the thing that a lot of people really want to know about. So, um, image process, pretty much the same as everything else. For anyone who's listening, you're probably getting kind of the idea. You upload your your raw files, whether they're floor plans or videos or images off to the editors and you get them back the next morning and that's pretty much the process. Um, are people restricted to to the look of their images, Guy? No, not not to a specific look, So, but they are to a specific quality standard. So we, we offer multiple styles, whether it be architectural style or a Scandi style that we developed or just we've got our standard daytime, we've got a standard twilight, we've got a natural style. You know, there's some brand styles we've had to match, right? So yeah, we have multiple styles um, and then we've been through, like we, we've got to a level of detail with our image production where, you know, we've specified hues of greens in grass. We've specified the colours of the sky and the luminance of the sky so they're correct. We've specified the amount of cloud that can be um, inputted in the sky and when that can, can and can't be done. So we have been through every single detail when it comes to image production for every single product to get the best possible product out um, and further to that, to do it at scale consistently year-round. And that is where the challenge is. So, you know, you can get cheap retouching. You can get cheaper retouching than we offer there. There's no doubt about that. Can you get it at the quality as consistently all year-round? Well, I'm almost certain you can't. Um, I don't think anybody else can do what we what, that what we do with images like that. So my clients buy a product from me. That product is put alongside their brand. Their brand has to in be is the most important thing to them, and how they present that brand is really important. If our images look crap or look different to what they're expecting, 
that's a problem for them and their brand because our images actually form part of their forward-facing brand. So being really consistent, being really high quality, um, and being able to deliver in the height of spring at time, you know, to meet press deadlines and at time standards that are, frankly, impossible in any other industry um, is what we've managed to achieve with, with our image production. Um, and you, you as a photographer might say, but I like retouching and that's okay. You can do that. But what you're doing is you're, you're, you've effectively created yourself a job, not a business. And that, again, that's a perfectly legitimate decision you can make for yourself. In which case your prop BWM is probably not right for you. People, the creatives that we have want to run a business. And that means taking things that can be done better by other people and getting them done by them, free yourself up to go and do more shoots, have more time on the shoots to be creative, build more relationships and therefore build your business. Um, so, so, you know, you, you can talk to a thousand different real estate photographers on the real estate photography forums and 500 will do their own retouching and will tell you why that's the best way to do it. And 500 will say, you know, something different that, you know, for pe- all the people who are in BWM understand that getting that, doing the editing is a low payoff activity in our language and needs to be done elsewhere. And so long as we hit those quality, consistency, and the photographer does their job in, with the creative, we are, we, we've got no problems. We've got absolutely no problems. And we, you, you, we see our stuff in architectural magazines and all over the place. You know, we're not just doing cheap, awful looking real estate photography stuff. You know, it, it's really high end look and feel stuff. And just for context as well, the, the amount of, um, just some numbers, the amount of images that go through our system per month on average is 17,000. Um, as I said, floor plans is 750 a month, videos is 250 a month. And our busiest, you're probably one of our busiest business, if not the, the busiest business guy. How many, how many jobs would you be going through, um, each month? At peak time. So we've, we run regionally. Um, and so we end up with a fairly, uh, seasonal business just because of the, the geography of it. Um, so we'll have a fairly large peak in sort of October, November where we might do 250 jobs. Um, now of those 250, you've probably got um, some of those will be rental jobs that have six images um, and some of those will be jobs that have 25 images, a video, drone photography, um, you know, a bit of twilight added in there and pretty much every single job has a floor and site plan. So um, at its peak, you know, we, we could be putting, in fact, two days ago we put 25 different jobs through in a single day in the middle of winter um, because the weather was good um, and, you know, we, we'd had a long weekend and we needed, you know, it all, it, all things um, conspired just to make 25 jobs need to happen in a day with videos, floor plans, images, all done, all delivered in, you know, by mid-morning. No problems. No, no problems at all. Have you ever had pushback from your clients about outsourcing your images? I remember when I started, there used to be photographers and I used to do all my own stuff as well. I think we all did. We've all kind of been there at 2 a.m. editing a video and, you know, editing the photo. But um, I remember previously when I first started or when I first started outsourcing, there would be photographers that kind of had it as a pride point where they'd say, oh, well, I do all my own editing. Have you have you found that that, that clients – look differently at you for, for outsourcing? I think a lot of them don't even know that we outsource. Um, so that's probably a portion of them. Um, and, and then the ones that do know are probably what, where I've had more pushback is where I've brought people into my team to actually shoot the product, right? So that's probably where I, I've, I've had the biggest pushback because – I've built the relationship. They're used to me. They know the way that I do things and now there's somebody else there, right? But what you can do when you outsource your product is you can train somebody, if they've got the right attitude, you can train somebody to have, you know, and they can build their own relationship with that client, right? So they do it their way but they do it correctly and they're respectful and they do all the great things on site to get the data but then 
at the end of the day, the, the product comes back and it looks no different to the product that I did. Um, so, you know, so I haven't had anybody, I haven't had anything but great feedback, frankly, about outsourcing. Um, and, and that's realistically because the products that we offer are better than I can do myself anyway. Yeah, I guess what happened with me in that scenario is quite interesting is that it, it, w- it was a competitor who, who prided himself on doing his own editing and he did a lovely job. But come spring, he couldn't keep up with it. He couldn't do all of that editing and he struggled with the turnaround and then he'd be on a shoot and couldn't make a change. And that, I think, that was more of a problem for the agents and that was a, a problem that was a real problem for them rather than kind of an abstract problem. And that is how I ended up getting that work. Yeah, and look, the, 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 that's the thing. So that, and that's just education um, with your clients that you need to do as a, as a business owner. You know, so if you're going to, mm. if you're going to, uh, if you've got a competitor who is actively undermining you, saying you're not as good because you don't do your retouching, well, then your way around that is to say, well, yes, but I can deliver my product to you at this consistent standard every single day of the year, no matter how many shoots you throw at me, right? And I can mm. go and break my leg next week and not be able to turn up to the job and I can bring one of my team in and they can do it and deliver the product. So there is a difference. Sure, that person does that and they've got absolute oversight of every single thing step along the way, but I've got oversight of the product before it gets to you. So I'm not going to send you anything that's not good enough. So Mm. you've still got my oversight, but now you've all of a sudden got insurance in your business. You know, you're not, you're not going to upset one of your clients. You're not going to lose a listing because, um, you know, something that happens that's outside of my control is just not going to happen. So that, to me, to me, you know, yeah, if you ever have that, you, you, there's so many logical ways to counter a, counter a, an angry creative, um, who insists that their way is better. And do you know what? It isn't, it isn't about better or worse. It's about, having a business or having a job. And and I'm in here because I wanted to have a business. Our members want to have a business. They want it to be sustainable for them and their families. And part of that is offloading things like this, these low payoff activities that we call low payoff activities um, and creating, you know, a situation where if you don't turn up to work tomorrow as a business owner, the business keeps going and the clients don't know, right? Go to a cafe. You meet the cafe owner, it's brand new and they're always there front of house and it's great. You build a relationship with them and you like going there. Then all of a sudden they've got staff because they're growing and you get to know the staff and then some days that person's not there and it doesn't change. Like the food's the same, the atmosphere is the same, you still have a great time. Why, look, you're not just leaving because that person's been successful at building a business. So mm. I sort of don't buy that argument with competitors if they want to undermine or try to undermine, they end up undermining themselves because realistically I, I don't go to battle saying, hey, we're better than than old mate. Yeah, I just say, I'll, I'll just deliver this to you every day of the week with you know, my one hand tied behind my back easy. So would you recommend to someone who's saying, I want to start a business, but they're coming out kind of um, it's a blank canvas, they, they're starting fresh, so they've probably got limited money, they're not doing a whole lot of work yet. Would you tell them to be outsourcing straight away or would you? Absolutely. Even though they've got time? Without question. Why? Yeah, without question. Because there's, you've got time. You've got a limited amount of time. So if you want to, if you want to run a business, let's, let's just, you know, talking in reality, small business owners work a lot more than 40 hours a week, right? Sure. But let's just talk generally. You've got 40 hours a week, right? In that 40 hours, there's one way you've got to generate income and that's going out and doing jobs, right? If you want to come home and then do your retouching or your video editing because you've got time, that's time you're not spending going and trying to find a client. It's time you're not spending flying your drone around doing a suburb profile so that your video editors can produce it so you can then show it to clients, right? It's just missed opportunity spending time doing that because, in inverted commas, you've got the time. You you you, you just won't build a business anywhere near as quickly um, as as somebody who outsources. So you sort of got to get your head out of the "Hey, it costs me money and I've got time." Well, your time's worth money. You want to run a million dollar business? Your time's worth five hundred dollars an hour. 
right? So yeah, it won't cost you 500 to get your images produced. So, but you can make $500 if you go out and win a client and shoot a video for them and photos, et cetera. Um, and you might spend 30 bucks getting your images produced. So I would say to anybody who is actually serious about a business, not a job, forget it. Get that, get those things done, get them streamlined and move on with your life and just focus on what's important. That's getting clients. What would you say to people who, um, I think this is probably more of an American thing, but um, what would you say to people who say, you know, this is a, an art form and you can't, you know, cookie cutter um, real estate, you know, my images are special and my agents use me because my images have that special look? Well, first of all, I'd just say that's marketing. I would say that's not actually reality um, because it's really important that the creative does a great creative job, right, regardless of who's producing, doing the retouching. Right. So you can do beautiful images and you should do beautiful images, you know, beautifully composed, well thought out, you know, attention to detail. You should be doing that as a photographer, right? So if, whether you're retouching them yourself or not, now you, just because you're not retouching them, what, who says the process isn't identical? It's just you not doing it, right? So, so, like, it doesn't make sense to me. It's just, it's just marketing. It's like, hey, I care, you know, I, I drag the slider exactly to this point, you know, because my gut tells me, well, great. So somebody else can drag the slider to that point because their gut tells them too. Mm. It's just, you know, it, it's just, to me, it's just marketing nonsense. Yeah. And it can, again, it can be overcome any which way you want. I understand that. That's, to me, that's some, a creative who wants a creative job. But there's a difference. If you want a business, a creative business, like is that person doesn't want to probably run a business. They probably haven't realized that they're never going to get a holiday. They're never going to get a break, right? If they can't. How can they? They do everything themselves. You know, imagine if the, the cafe owner was cooking all the food, serving everything, um, taking, you know, taking everybody's money and doing the dishes. I mean, come on. It doesn't, it doesn't work. It's not a business. You know, that's just breakfast at my house. Well, you're not doing the dishes. We know that. If everyone listens to the episode four, <laughs> he's doing the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> well, the dishwasher's doing the dishes these days. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess the other thing is also you've got to think about what your clients are seeing, and it goes into what you said about running a business. Your clients aren't watching you drag that slider. They're not watching that artistry. So it's a bit of a vanity exercise as well. You're not doing it for anyone else's benefit. If you're having the same standard of product, if you're having that high quality, what the clients are going to see is you on site taking a plant from one, from one room and putting it in the other and swapping around the cushions and, you know, moving the furniture and doing those things and building the relationships and patting the dogs and all the other stuff that goes into it. I, I think that that is where the creativity and, and the flair comes in. Creative happens at the camera. Yeah, it doesn't happen yeah. in the studio. Like that, that's... Nonsense. So you, you can find equally people who will say, hey, I shoot film because I don't retouch at all. And great. They don't have any work. So, like, <laughs> you, you can make any argument you want. It, it, it's, it's nonsense. The creativity is where what is, you know, and, and is the copyright is what is coming off that, off that lens or burning into that sensor. That's, that's the reality. Mm. That's where you do your creative work. Right. And you can systemize the rest of it. If you've got a look that only you can produce, that can be replicated. Right. Mm. You can. I, I just don't have that conversation with people. It just doesn't happen. It's also funny because you can go very extreme in the opposite direction as well. It reminds me of training I once did with a very well known, high profile real estate photographer. And his entire session that he did with us was about how you don't need to do any editing if you do the right kind of lighting and setup on site. And what he was telling us to do was basically get a lot of extra lighting, different sheets to hang from windows, all sorts of stuff, and take an entire day to shoot five photos of one house. And I remember sitting there just being like, how on earth are we supposed to do this as a business? Like, yes, I'm not going to be editing tonight, but instead of doing six jobs or five jobs today or even four jobs, I'm going to have one job a day. And this is for real estate. It's a it's a commodity. It's great if you're shooting it for, you know, a magazine, but you're shooting it for a house that's going to be sold in four weeks. So it, it 
these images get used for such a small window of time. It just, yeah, it didn't make any sense. So anyways, I just found it really interesting that you can go so far in the opposite direction as well. And that really it all just comes down to running a business. Well, it's interesting that that person flies around the world training rather than actually shooting real estate for, for money. Um, so, so that'd be the first point I'd make. Yeah, that's a way to shoot for sure, but you, it's not a, it's not commercially viable. Not in our industry. Like you might do magazine shoots like that where you do one a day or something like that and you charge thousands and thousands of dollars oh, and if absolutely. that's what you want to do, but I don't want to do that. But that's a creative agency and at the end of the day, the photographer's not making the money there. The ad agency is and there'll be 15 people on the job, right? It's such a different thing. By all means, go take beautiful photos and do it do it however however you want to do. But if you want to run a business in a real estate industry, there's things that need to happen and one of them is outsourcing and get it done from day one, right? Don't start with a, a crappy, you know, even if, you're, even if you're great at it, but reality is it's quite hard to do. So don't start with an average looking product and then, you know, you'll only be able to charge an average amount of price and say, oh, yeah, but when I get busy, I'll be able to, I'll be able to afford the outsourcing and then my product get better and be able to charge more. It's not going to happen. You're just going to go out of business before you get there. So, mm. you know, you might hear yeah. that I'm kind of passionate about this. I've done it a few times and I, and I don't, I just don't see a commercial path for a business owner. I think the other thing, the other thing to consider is that, um, you know, as creative as you want to be, you want to be creative on site. If you're spending all your energy being creative, you know, in inverted commas by doing your editing and drawing your floor plans and doing your edits of videos, it's, it gets progressively harder to be, to be, um, creative on site when you've been going to bed at four o'clock in the morning. Mm. Yeah. And I've heard photographers like they have said this to me that I've met and haven't ultimately joined, you know, a, you know, I want to just, I want everything but the video editing because, you know, I've got time and I'm like, cool, when have you got time? Well, I'll do it at night. It's like, cool, so what did your wife think about that? Oh, well, I just do it while you're on the couch watching Netflix. I'm like, that's got a good life ahead of it, doesn't it? Like, I mean, what happens when you've got kids and, like, this is your only time to talk to your wife and you're doing video editing on the couch? Like, you'd be divorced years that yeah i remember enjoying it but and i remember having this conversation with dave and that's i think the other thing is we've all been that person late at night editing our videos ourselves playing with them it, and it can be fun you can get some kind of personal creative satisfaction out of it but it really like i said it's it's about you that's not about your business it's not about your clients it's really about you as soon as you outsource you go oh <laughs> I don't want to outsource it. I like doing it. I tell you what, I like not doing it more than I like doing it. Like once you do it, you don't look back. It's really, really nice. One hundred percent. I also like learning a new instrument or language or whatever else you can do with all that time you get back. A really interesting um, uh, point to make is actually about what Dave's done. So Dave sold his BWM business on the Mornington Peninsula, right? He sold a business right, a business that had a value attributed to it by a business valuer. And I can tell you now, Dave would not have been able to sell that business because it wouldn't have been a business that was able to be sold if he did his image production, floor plan production and video editing. First of all, he would have turned over a quarter of what he turned over. Second of all, how do you train that? You've then got to find a buyer who wants to pay you money so they can produce all of these products. But instead, you just had a hot swap. One of your contractors who already knew what to do on site, already knew the clients, basically paid you to take over that role and the product stayed the same, the service stays the same, the clients haven't moved anywhere, they're really happy. The client's probably happier. Well, of course. I mean, you've met Dave. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so to me, it's, it, it, is, it just fundamentally comes down to to the difference between a business and a job being logical and illogical. Um, it, you know, it, so if, if you say you want a business but you're still uh, convincing yourself that you need to be doing these things and you're just not being logical in my view um, and, and in reality, the businesses, you know, we have another pillar on our platform which is the pathway and we take, which we'll talk about, but we take photographers from turning over zero to a number that we'll discuss at another time in 12 months, and they can only do that. 
because they use the products. It's just not an option any other way. Well, Guy, I think that is a very in-depth look at our first pillar um, product of, of what we're offering, why it's better, but also why it's so important for people to do this and to take that step in outsourcing if they really do want to grow a sustainable business, um, which is what we're all about. So thank you so much for your time. Um, and yeah, I look forward to talking about the next pillar with you in part two of the series. No worries. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Guy.